We are building a culture of leaders, not just people who call themselves Christians, but men and women who will rise up to be the change agents in our society. People who believe that there is way too much at stake just to passively let life go by. Our leadership will be defined by these four guiding principles. We will be leaders who are tenaciously teachable. We will be the kind of leaders who are marked with contagious joy. We will be defined as servant leaders. And deep inside of every one of us, you will find a warrior spirit. We believe everything rises and falls on leadership. Leaders shape environments instead of being shaped by them. We are the kind of people who set the pace. We blaze the trail. And as a church, we are committed to raising up men and women who will lead and love just like Jesus. Well, what's up, Echo Church? Good to be with you today. We're so pumped about this brand new teaching series. You have picked a great day to be in church. We want to let you know that we're going to have some fun over the next four weeks. And we want to welcome, actually, those of you who are joining us online, everybody at our Sunnyvale campus, those of you at our South, and of course, North San Jose. Can we make some noise for all of our campuses joining us today? You know, whenever you hear the phrase leadership, it's an interesting word because I think that there are a lot of people who want to be leaders, especially here in Silicon Valley with all the tech companies and influence globally. A lot of us want to be leaders, but there are some people when they hear the word leadership, it's like a four letter word. And maybe for you, you don't see yourself as a leader. So to think about spending four weeks on leadership at church is kind of difficult for you. You'd rather move on to something else. But what I believe is that part of us moving in to greater levels of influence as a church is having a better understanding of what it means to actually be a leader. And what I want to do over these next four weeks is I want to set a framework for us as a church. What does it mean to lead here at Echo Church? See, part of what we do as a church is we open the door wide and we try to reach our community with God's love, as many people as possible. In fact, the You Ask For It series that really was a part of that, of what we do, even our strategy to say, how do we answer the questions that people are asking? It was one of our best series we've had. More people showed up for that series than any other series in our church's history. So it's awesome. And at the same time, as we grow wider and the breadth of our ministry increases, the depth or the strength of our church needs to continue to grow as well. So this Leadership Code series really is about strengthening you at your core with your faith so that you can go back to your place of work and you can go back to your school and back to your family and you can be a person of influence. And in order to step into that, what we have to do, especially with leadership, is redefine what it means to lead. I love this quote from John C. Maxwell, and this is what we're going to build on with this series. Leadership is influence. At the end of the day, that's what it means to lead. So you can be a leader at any place in your organization, from the CEO to the janitor, to a mom, to a dad, to a student. All of us have the ability and the opportunity to be an influencer on people around us. And a lot of times people think that leadership is really just about a position or a title or a tagline, but really leadership is ultimately about influence. So we're going to go through our four values as a church around leadership. We call it the leadership code. And we're going to talk about how do we influence people. Number one, this week we're going to talk about servant leadership. That Jesus gave us a model of what it means to lead. He flipped leadership upside down and gave us a new picture of leadership. Next week we're going to talk about contagious joy and how leaders are not thermometers, they're thermostats. That means that they change the environment with their attitude and with their mindset and with their words. Next week that's going to be a lot of fun to talk about joy. The third week we're going to look at the subject of tenacious teachability. And we're going to talk about how we keep getting better and growing and becoming more of who God wants us to be. And then the fourth and final week, we're going to look at how you can get knocked down and get back in the ring to say, I am not going to give up. I'm going to have a warrior spirit. That's the fourth and final value. And these values really are at the core of how we lead as a church. These values are what produce leaders in our culture. And today, as we start off our series, what I want to do is I want to wrestle through a question that is at the core of really understanding leadership. And it's this question, why is it that Jesus was able in three short years with his influence with a group of 12 people to start a movement 
and he would grow on to become the greatest and most influential leader in all of human history. In fact, um, it's amazing to think about the influence of Jesus 2,000 years after his life here on planet Earth, that there are more books about Jesus, more songs sung to him, more artists' renderings of him than any other person in human history. And what Jesus was able to do was he was able to catalyze a movement that transcended the 33 years he lived here. There were things that changed about society. The way that women were treated were changed, was changed. The way that children were treated was changed. Yes, we can cheer for all these. Children in, uh, in Jesus' society were not valued. Women were pushed to the back. Jesus elevated, promoted women. They were the first ones at the empty tomb, the first ones to declare that Jesus had resurrected. Jesus changed the way that people in poverty were treated. His followers went on to start hospitals to help people who were sick. Society is different today. So many little statements like, go the extra mile, come from Jesus, turn the other cheek, do to your neighbors that you would have them do to you. There are all these things that Jesus did. A lot of us don't even realize the influence of Jesus that we are living in today in the 21st century. And we got to wrestle through what was it about the way that Jesus led that had such a powerful influence. I believe that if we understand Jesus' leadership, we'll, be the, we'll experience the greatest amount of impact we can with our lives. And today we're going to look at Jesus' model of servant leadership. And I want to define for us as a church, what does a servant leader do? How does a servant leader lead differently? And I want you today, as we're walking through this message, to think not just the domain of work. Now, work is very important and valuable, but I want you to think about your family. I want you to think about your, the church that you, this church that you're a part of. I want you to think about um, all the different relationships that you have, how this principle or this model of leadership can be leveraged for every environment that you're in. And I hope today, at the end of the day, you will start to see yourself through this lens that I can lead and make a difference with my life. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 20 and, um, this is a fun story to talk through or teach through. In fact, I love, love, love this story because you're going to see the authenticity of a few followers of Jesus and their desire for leadership. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is going to say some things that are really, really important. And I think that it's probably the most succinct explanation or teaching on leadership that Jesus gives. And this passage of scripture like it trumps, now I know we have a lot of Stanford people in our church, but this passage of scripture trumps an MBA at Stanford. It's so good, okay? I love you, Stanford, but it, it, MIT, all those schools, man, you guys are amazing. Santa Clara University, San Jose State, all awesome. But Jesus, what he lays down here, if you and I get it, is greater than a degree in leadership in just a few verses from the Bible. So in verse 17, it says, as Jesus was on his way up to Jerusalem, which means that they were hiking up a hill. Jerusalem was like several thousand feet above sea level or above where they were in Galilee. So they marched up to Jerusalem. There were no Ubers back in that day to get there. They had to walk. And it says, he took his 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Now, it's important to understand Jesus was doing two things as he was ministering to the crowds. He was also developing people. That's a part of the reason why the kingdom is here today, because Jesus poured into a, a group of people that would carry his teaching and his kingdom forward. At the core of his movement was a group of leaders that he invested in, these disciples. So Jesus is going to give them a teaching on the side as he's doing his ministry. So it says he pulls them aside and told them what was going to happen. Verse 18, listen, he said. Sometimes we need to be told to listen. He's about to lay down. He says, we are going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man, now Jesus is talking in third person here, where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. And then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, to be flogged with a whip, and crucified. But, Jesus says, on the third day, he will be raised again from the dead. Why did Jesus say this? Why did he say it? It's interesting to think about because, you know, I think that I don't, I wouldn't really like Jesus to tell me he's going to die. His disciples at this point are still 
a little bit confused at what he was trying to do. I think part of them thought, like, we're going to beat the Romans. We're going to be in positions of leadership. We're all going to be recognized as heroes of this new kingdom. We might even get some corner offices, get a cool payout, get some Teslas at the end of the deal, blue and white for the colors of Israel. Like, that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes into his full kingdom. Yet Jesus starts to lay down, I'm, I'm going to die. The Romans are going to murder me. They're going to flog me. They're going to whip me. They're going to beat me. At the end of this, this is what is going to happen. Jesus is going to, to lay down. This is how my kingdom is going to come to fruition. But there's also something else that Jesus is doing here. See, he's warning them about the trouble that is to come. But he also tells them of what's going to happen at the end of the story. He's trying to help them understand on Saturday when I'm dead, it's not done. Like when I'm placed into the grave and my body is there, there's no more life, no more breath, I'm not finished. So if it's not good, God's not done. Sometimes you need to know that. Like it's Saturday for some of you here today and you're in the midst of difficulty and trial and tribulation. And if it's not good, God's not done. He's still working it together for your good, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Jesus wanted them to understand when I'm crucified, don't be surprised, <laughs> but also know that it's not the finish that I'm going to, I'm going to overcome death. So you're like, okay, that's cool. Thank you, Jesus. I got that. We can move on to the next lesson of leadership. And Jesus disciples at this point, after getting kind of a picture of what's about to come in verse 20, it says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. Now, before we get to the favor, you know, sometimes you just got to put mom up to your dirty work. You know what I'm saying? Like, moms are amazing, aren't they? We love moms around here. Last week, we had an amazing Mother's Day celebration. Um, Suzette from the North San Jose campus and several other leaders did a phenomenal job, gave out face masks to all the moms. Somehow, my 11-year-old got a couple of them. And on the way home from church, I looked back, and he's got a face mask on. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But we love moms around here. Moms are awesome. Um, and sometimes part of a mom's job is to do the dirty work for their kids, right? If you're a mom, you know this. If you're a child, you, you sometimes you rely on mom. I remember I was in college and uh, I got pulled over by a cop, a police officer, excuse me, um, at the airport. And I got nervous. I couldn't find my wallet. I couldn't find my license. So this police officer, I don't know if he thought I was like, had a bomb or, you know, I stopped there. I stopped in the wrong place. And he came up to me and he's like really angry with me. So I looked at him. I'm like, I can't find my wallet, your honor. And <laughs> he looks back. He's like, I'm not a your honor. And he just starts cussing me out. Well, he didn't know my mom, Marcy, doesn't take it. So uh, she heard about this, and she actually went to the police office, and she got that guy and his boss, and she cussed him out, <laughs> threw down, the brother negated my ticket, said he was sorry. He apologized to me. He actually came up to me and said, I'm sorry. That's awesome. That's what moms do sometimes, right? So, you know, send your mom to Jesus, maybe ask her to do your dirty work. So mom comes up to Jesus and she kneels down respectfully before Jesus and watch what she's going to ask for. Jesus says, what is your request? She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the places of honor next to you, one on your left and the other on your right or on your right and on your left. When you come into the fullness of your kingdom, what I'm asking is maybe if you could reserve some thrones for my son. That's interesting now, isn't it? I think about like the position of leadership, the throne. How many of you guys grew up in a church where they had thrones on stage? Just out of curiosity. You know, the big, you know, the big robes and the thrones. The church I grew up in had really big thrones. And um, you knew who was important by the size of the throne. And sometimes life is like that. You know, we want that position. We love 
nobility. We love thrones, which brings up a really important question. How many of you guys watched the royal wedding this weekend, just out of curiosity? Just keep your hands up. Come on, just come on. Raise them up high. Um, okay, how many of you, keeping those hands up, how many of you woke up at 4 a.m. to watch, watch the royal wedding? Hands still up. We got some counseling for you afterwards. <laughs> Why is it that people would wake up at 4 a.m. to watch a wedding? I just don't understand it. I mean, maybe it's amazing, but part of it is that we, we love nobility, isn't it? And it's pretty cool to see like all these important people that show up to the wedding because like you got Oprah there, and she's got her cool dress on, and then everybody's checking out the big hats. And like their hats, I would not let my wife be caught dead in. That's, I mean, they're like... You know, you got to widen the door just to get through. That's what some of these hats look like. So you got Oprah, Serena Williams, you had George Clooney and David Beckham, who makes every man on earth feel insecure because <laughs> every woman thinks he's hot, including my wife. But she tells me I'm more hot than him, which is good. But um, I'm not sure if she's lying. But, but, you know, there's all these famous people. And part of what you see at the royal wedding is that, you know, Nobility and significance based upon position. The seating matters. And isn't it interesting how we as humans, we love the throne and we love the crown. In fact, I was in the UK last week and I got this crown there. This was actually King James II's crown. Isn't that awesome? No, I ordered it on Amazon, dude. But you get the point. Like we, we love the crown. We love positions of leadership. And it makes sense. Like, hey, before you die, let's just get this whole thing settled. Um, One throne for James and one throne for John. That's all I'm asking. Like, that's all I need. Just please take care of this. Now, James and John were part of an inner circle, the three Peter, James, and John. So it made sense, you know, like if if only two of them can get thrones out of the three, let's make sure it's my two, right? Because they need the position of leadership. Isn't it interesting in our mindset how often leadership is about a position? So if I asked you if you were a leader, immediately our natural tendency is to go to a position. But Jesus was going to build an entirely different mindset around what it means to lead. In fact, Jesus looks back at them in verse 22. He says, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? See, Jesus is saying, when you ask for the right and the left, you have no clue what it means to be on my right and on my left. Are you able to endure the cup or the difficulty of suffering that I'm about to go through? Jesus is trying to flip their mindset. So often in leadership, our mindset is about a position. And what Jesus is going to help them understand in this passage is it's not about a position, it's about a posture. What a servant leader does, number one, if you're taking notes, what does a servant leader do? Number one, a servant leader focuses on posture over position. There's a posture that Jesus wants to be embodied by people who will be leaders in his kingdom. And the posture is one of service and it's one of humility. See, our tendency as humans and even in our culture and society with the understanding of leadership being about position, position is how do I push to get to the front? How do I push so that people can recognize me? How do I push so that I'm the leader? But Jesus says, actually, in my kingdom, in in my understanding, in your understanding of leadership, what I want for you is not to push to the front for position. What I want you to do is leverage what you have to push to the back, to bless, to serve, to love other people. That is what leadership is in my kingdom. So if you shift your mindset instead of focusing on a position, now what you're going to do is you're going to start focusing on posture. It's a different way of leading. It's a different way of living. I, um, Hurt my back a couple of months ago, and so I was talking to somebody from our church who's in the training and does an awesome job helping with working out and getting healthy, and so she was giving me some advice, and she she was saying, as she watched some of my lifting, like that I had bad posture, and so she was teaching me about how to have good posture, and what she said was, if you take your shoulder blades and you tuck them into your back pockets, that's how you get good posture, so try it real quick, just tuck your shoulder blades in the back pockets. (laughs) It helps a little bit. 
And um, somebody else told me I had bad posture that they were noticing while I was preaching that my posture was bad, which means they weren't listening to anything else. <laughs> how bad my posture is. Thank you very little for that one. But what my friend said when she was helping with, with posture was that you have all these other problems. Your injury is because your posture's off. See, misplaced posture or bad posture, what it does is it creates injury. It does this in leadership as well. So if a leader doesn't have the right posture, an organization gets diseased or unhealthy. So Jesus is saying there's, there's a posture that I want you to change when it comes to leadership. Here, here it is. You don't need a title or a position to be a leader. You need the right posture. In Philippians chapter 2 uh, verse 5 is talking about the Son of God. Now before you go there, I want you to think about If anybody deserves to be recognized as the leader, it's the one who created the universe. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says something about Jesus and his choices to let go of some of the divine privilege that he was deserved. In verse 5 it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, true nobility at the highest level, though he was God, he did not consider or think equality with God as something to be held on to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position or posture of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. This is leadership in the kingdom of God. This is what it means to truly move God's power and his love and his church forward. It's leaders, men and women who will lay down their privileges for the sake of a vision that's bigger than their life. So what we do is we put our posture as the focal point, not our position as the focal point. And what I love about our church is we have so many people who do this so beautifully. Uh, I love the story of Verona and Andrew who programmed the lights at our North San Jose campus. Anytime we do a new song, they'll come in as volunteers, not paid, for four to five hours to program a new song. So that means when you and I are sitting there with our cup of coffee and we're like, woo, what a great day, worshiping Jesus, encountering the presence of God, that moment was paved by their sacrifice, their willingness to come in and program lights when, you know, we're watching the Warriors game. There they are, programming, serving, and giving up of themselves. Uh, I love the example of our South San Jose setup team that they come in at 5.30. A guy by the name of Ken comes in at 5.30 on Sunday morning, hauls trailers back and forth, pulls out pipe and drape, works with the team. When people come in and they hear the good news of Jesus or babies are held or the next generation is influenced, it was paved by this guy's sacrifices. See, what we need to understand is we're building a culture as a church that a great church is not built on the talents of a few people. A great church is built on the sacrifices of many people. There are three to 400 people that are serving on a monthly basis that are sacrificing for the sake of this vision. No role in the kingdom of God is more important than the other. It may be more prominent. It may be recognized more. But what Jesus is saying is what I'm doing is building something that will move forward and last. And what has to happen for us to build a movement that will last is we have to be the kind of people that are not concerned about getting the recognition or title attached to our name. We don't have to work hard to convince people to stand on a stage. Now, I love our worship team, and we have some humble servant leaders who stand on the stage and worship here, but we've had a lot of people come in, and they immediately want the stage, but their character's not ready for the stage. Their character's not ready for the platform. See, what God wants you to do is focus on your posture. He'll focus on your platform. He'll focus on your, your, your position. He'll, he'll put you in the position that you need to be in in order to lead if you focus on serving and humbling yourself to put the goals and interests of others above your own. Now, let me get real practical, okay? Here's one question that you can ask, and this is how we can do it. So I want you to think of your different environments, work, home, family, school. What if on Monday, when you go to work, you come home, or you go to your place where all your roommates live, what if the first question out of your mouth when you walked into the room was this? How can I help you? Woo! That hurts. Let's say it together. How can I help you? 
Try it. Now, your wife might give you a honey-do list when you do that. (laughs) But if that was the mindset when we walked into an environment, when you go to your place of work, if you were truly there to help, it would make a massive difference when it came to leadership, for you being able to, to influence the lives of other people around you. You wouldn't need to push for a title or a position anymore. You would be elevated over the course of time as a leader and be given more and more influence if you were constantly asking the question, how can I help you? Now, this does not mean that you are helping people with their dysfunction and doing their jobs for them. This simply means that your mindset, wherever you are, is you are there to serve. I think about our leadership as a church. If we had that mindset when we walked through the door, there would be nothing that is below any of us. There's no job that is, a, that is beneath any leader in the kingdom of God. If there's a piece of trash, we can pick it up. If there's a toilet that needs to be cleaned, we can clean it. If somebody's feet need to be washed, we can wash those feet. Everybody in the kingdom of God, we are subject to the same rules. We have the same king. And if our mindset is to help and bless other people, it begins to shift how we think about leadership. I hope that you and I can understand the power of this reality if we can continue anytime we are given any kind of level of leadership, any kind of influence. We say, how can I make a difference and how can I help you with the leadership that has been given to me? Now, they thought they understood what it meant to lead when Jesus responded back to them. In fact, if you go back to the passage of Scripture, when Jesus looks back at them and says, okay, hey, you don't know what you're, gonna, you're getting yourself into And you, are you able to drink from this cup? We are able. And Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the one that he's chosen. So God assigns your position in his kingdom. You focus on your posture. Verse 24, when the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked for the thrones of leadership, they were indignant. You ever had that happen at work? Like somebody goes for the position, you're mad at them, it's all get out, or somebody gets promoted, and you're like, I should have been the one to get the position. I get it. It's human tendency, right? And these guys are all frustrated with, with their brothers, Peter and James, or, J- or James and John, for asking for the positions of leadership. But Jesus called them together in verse 25, and he said this, listen, he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Jesus is saying, this is what it's like in the world around you. The Romans, they have all these rules. Like if they come to you and say, you got to carry my bag a mile, you had to carry their bag a mile as a Jewish person. Yet Jesus was say to them, actually, that's where the phrase carry the extra mile came. Jesus said, if they actually carried a mile, carry it another mile. Keep on going. And this was the vision of leadership. The Romans were in charge. They had oppressed the Israelites. When they were given a position of authority, the position that they were given of authority was so that they could leverage it to make their lives easier, so that they could get somebody else to carry their bags. But Jesus says, actually, when you enter into my kingdom, in verse 26, he says, but among you, it will be different. If you want to lead in my kingdom, I have an entirely different value system. It is not a value system that says we take our authority and we leverage it to push other people down. What we do in the kingdom of God, if we're going to follow Jesus and lead in his kingdom, what we do is we take our leadership, he says, whoever wants to be a leader, notice he doesn't correct them for their desire for leadership. He says, but whoever wants to be a leader in my kingdom, what they need to do is become the servant or the slave of the people in front of them that they're leading. So here's what this means. If you are a leader, every bit of authority that God has been given, has given to you, has been given to you by God so that you can bless other people. So point number two is servant leaders, what they do is they leverage authority to add value. You have authority in your life. You may not feel like you do, You have responsibility and positions and influence that God has already given to you. Might be small, might be a lot. You might be the CEO. You might might serve on a team with two people that direct report to you, or you might have eight bosses, but you do have influence. And if you shift your mindset to say, I am not here to leverage my influence for my benefit. I'm here to leverage my influence to add value to people around me. It changes. It changes everything about our leadership. See, we all know somebody who leads and it's all about them. 
right? Like they get the microphone and they're telling stories and they're like, yeah, the other day when I was, and then I did this and then I made the sale and uh, yeah, I was like, my boss. You know what I'm talking about? Like that, that person on your team that like every time they get an opportunity to lead a me, it's all about me, man. Me, 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 the me monster. Me, 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 me. There's a really funny uh, YouTube video on the me monster, but it's like, you know, the other day when I was on the moon and I was, you know, in a r- lunar rover on the moon and man, I'm just awesome. Look at me. And it's interesting though, how often as leaders, we think that it's really about us. I go, through this, I go through this rehearsal in my mind of prayer when I stand backstage right before I walk on stage and I say, God, it's, it's not about me. I care less if they know my name. What I want to do is I want to leverage every bit of what you've put in me to bless people. I, I want to serve. I want to share your truth boldly. I want at the end of the day to honor you that when people, when people hear the message, it was glorifying to you and it was helpful for them. Honor you and help other people. And if you give me the rest of my life, I'll do it. That's what, I want to leverage every bit of influence you've given me to bless people. It's amazing how this changes the way you, you think. See, sometimes in our generation, we feel like we have to prove ourselves to other people. But gaining leadership in God's kingdom is not about proving yourself. You have already been approved of by God. So you have nothing to prove to other people. I get all these opportunities to be in environments with leaders who are way beyond where I am in leadership. And I deal with this insecurity of like, I need people to know I'm a good leader. And I I had this shift recently where God was like, Andy, if you just go in and love people and bless people, it doesn't matter. Find somebody that you can love and you can bless when you're in an environment. So I came up with this cool acronym. I'm gonna give it to you for free today. (laughs) So um, here's the little acronym that I came up with. When I enter into an environment, I'm thinking this. I'm here to bless. Say it. In a meeting, when I go to work, when, when when I'm hanging out with friends, I am here. I'm not here to take. I'm not here to receive. I'm here to be a blessing. So use me. So here are these five things. Number one, bring something. Everybody loves somebody who brings a bottle of wine. They do. They do. Maybe not to church, but to, um, they would love you. Maybe my sermons would be better if everybody did that. Um, But you bring something where you go. Number two is you listen. So, you know, sometimes we go places and we're talking the whole time, but we learn to use two ears, one mouth. Listen. Number three is to encourage so use your words to encourage people. Find something that somebody's doing well and, and speak life by encouraging them. Number three is to serve. And this is to notice things around you that can be done. This is a part of what we do when we're onboarding staff. I like to get staff, potential staff members, in a place where the dishes need to be cleaned. Because I know if they'll jump in and clean the dishes when the dishes need to be cleaned, that they'll jump in when something needs to be done. Last week, we, um, we were in a meeting, and we have all these um, mugs at the North San Jose campus on these shelves, and the Echo logo was upside down. It was driving me nuts. It was like five of the mugs, the Echo logo was upside down. I was about to have a heart attack. They were about to call EMS. But it, like, my leadership like, mentality said, just, just see, who, uh, see how well the team has embraced the value of excellence. Just let it go. And I watched Nick Copland from our South San Jose campus go over to these mugs and just flip the Echo logos over. It was like instant peace filled my soul. It was like an overwhelming sense of the presence of God just came over me in that moment. I was like, that, that's my bro right there. Ooh, I could just be, it's something though about like when you're there to serve, right? There's a piece of trash on the ground. What do we do? We pick it up. You know, you go into the bathroom and there's water all over it. Just wipe it down. It's just a, it's a mindset. I'm trying to get my boys who are 9 and 11 to get this. They still are, suck at it, but we're, we're working on it. Like we're, we're trying to say we're here to serve. And then finally, we're here to speak wisdom. So we, we use our words to, to bless people, to speak wisdom into their lives. Could you imagine if, if you just had this acronym at work on Monday? If you just had this at school, you're, I am here to add value. A lot of us are depressed in our lives because we're sucking the life out of everything around us. And it's really just a mindset shift to say, I am here. I am blessed 
by God to be a blessing. So take your journal out on Monday morning and write down 50 ways that God has blessed you. And then when you write those 50 ways down that God has blessed you or 30 or 10, you then say, okay, if God's blessed me, I can bless other people. There's a power in this when we learn to add value. So Jesus says, hey, in my kingdom, we flip it upside down. We're not here to be served. We're here to serve among you. It will be different. In verse 28, he concludes his thoughts and he says this, for even, for even the son of man, even Jesus himself, the one who deserves all honor and glory as the king of of heaven, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying that in my kingdom, servant leaders sacrifice personal comfort for the sake of a mission. That's what we do. And this has been hard for me, if I'm really honest. Part of the part of the battle of being a pastor is realizing how much I preach that I am just absolutely horrible at. And I don't mean it in such a way that like I've disqualified myself. It's just the, the, the longer I follow Jesus and I realize what it means to follow him. It's like the apostle Paul at the end of his life when he said, I'm the chief of sinners. And I realize at the end of the day, I am not the example. Jesus is the example. He's, he's the one that exemplifies for us what it means to lead in such a way that you give up your comfort for others. Now, you, there are lots of examples of people like this at our church and lots of heroes who are serving and laying down their own comfort for the sake of a mission. But at the end of the day, there's this realization that this is a bar that Jesus has set for us that we can spend our entire lives striving towards. And we're gonna get better and we're gonna grow. But what has to shift is this mindset to say, I'm not trying to hold on to my comfort anymore. I'm not trying to hold on to my ease of life anymore. I used to think it would get easier. I, it was such a dumb belief system for me. I thought the longer I led, the easier it would get. I really did believe that. I thought that I'd, I'd have, when our team got bigger and maybe my office got bigger, that like it get easier. It, it's, it's not gotten easier for me. It's gotten harder the longer I follow Jesus. And there are so many of us who shortchange our growth as leaders because we've not gotten to the place where we die to ourself so the kingdom of God can come to its fullest fruition through our lives. We hang on to our comfort. It's about us. It's about our ease. It's about life being less painful for us. If you want the blessing of leadership, you have to endure the pain and hardship that comes in the kingdom of God. There are a lot of messages I could give you that are way more fluffy than this and get more amens than I'm getting right now. But this is it. This is leadership. And I was struck this week when I was reading the Gospel of Matthew when you hear the description of this mom coming to Jesus and asking for her sons to be on the right and to be on the left. Because if you fast forward to Matthew chapter 27, at the end in verse 50, you can read this later because it's not coming on the screens. But in verse 50, as Jesus is hanging there on a cross, breathing his last breath, it says, Jesus shouted again and he released up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, get this, from the top to the bottom, which is God making a way so all of humanity could come. Presence of God being made accessible to broken human beings like you and me. The temple's torn, top to bottom, curtains torn, tombs open, bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead right there. It's amazing, like with your death, if you can resurrect people, it's just unbelievable. They left the cemetery and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer, did you imagine? That's a passage nobody ever preaches on, like dead people coming out of their graves at Jesus' death. That'd be a great Easter sermon next year. Um, <laughs> Just imagine that, like you're, you know, you're over at, at cemetery off of Kurtner and just all these bodies, so it's like zombies coming out. And so they start coming out. It says the Roman officer and other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by this earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, this is what hit me. It said in verse 55, and many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus 
to care for him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. So Mary, Jesus' mom is there as well. And it says, and the mother, get this, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So here now in this moment, she's asked Jesus for her sons to be placed on his right and his left. And she's watching this all unfold. Remember what Jesus said? You don't know what you're asking for. You really don't. You have no idea what, what this means when you say to go on my right and my left. So she's watching, get this, she's watching as Jesus is up above her and above Jesus, there's a sign. Do you know what the sign says? It says, Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So they're like, you want a king? We'll give you a king. Here's your king right here, the King of the Jews. And when she looks at Jesus, she, she sees a crown on him. But the crown that she sees on Jesus is, is not this cool British crown. The crown that she sees on Jesus when he's hanging there on the cross is a crown of thorns that has been placed into his head to mock him. But what Jesus is helping her understand and what Jesus wants us to see today is that in my kingdom, the crown comes with a cross. If you want the kingdom leadership of a crown, what you need to be willing to do is endure the difficulty of a cross. And here is this woman and she's watching Jesus with his arms spread out wide. And he says, this, this is leadership in my kingdom. You want, you want kingdom, you want lead, leadership and influence in my kingdom. You got to be willing to lay down your life for the sake of others. Now, good news is you don't have to die for the sins of the world. He already paid the price so that you can know God. But what he's asking you is will you be willing to give up your comfort to follow me? And as you follow me into your discomfort, I will lead you into influence in my kingdom. It's hard. It means that sometimes you give up money. Sometimes you give up sleep. Sometimes you give up a few hours on a Sunday to serve. But Jesus gave a vision of what he was building, that I am building something here that is going to last for eternity. I'm building something here that is gonna carry on for generations. So like when you watch people today get baptized at your campus and go public with their faith in Jesus, you are a part of a story. If you serve, you are a part of that person's eternity being changed by the local church. And every time you sacrifice, whether it is your time or your money or your energy, you are investing in something that far transcends this life. So Jesus says, I want you to be a person of influence. I want you to be a great leader. I want you to change the world around you. And when I get a group of people, when I get a church, when I get a team of people that are not concerned about their comfort or their ease of life, there is no limit to what I can do through them. There's no limit to what I can accomplish through their life. So my question for you is, what are you holding on to today? And what are you struggling to give up for influence? In order to go up, you gotta give up. And for every one of us, Jesus will challenge the things that you hold on to. There's something for some of you today that you are holding on to that is preventing you from being used by God. It might be a relationship that God's told you to give up. It might be the fact that people are gonna misunderstand you because you're gonna have to lock in on something he told you to lock in on. It might be the fact that the, you might have a few less dollars in your savings account because he told you to give a certain amount of money away. He will challenge whatever you hold on to. And it's not, it's not out of frustration. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's just because he's got so much more for you. And the more that your hands are clutched to the things of this world, the less you can have eternal significance in the way that God wants you to. So our hands, as they're like this, we can't receive the mantle of leadership that God has for us. So we got to lay the baseline down to say, in this church, in this house, we are servant leaders. There's no job that is below any of us. No toilet 
that a leader can't clean, no pick a piece of trash we can't pick up, no conversation that we can't have. We are all servant leaders. We have different roles and responsibilities. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do as a leader is to do what God's called you to do, and you might be misunderstood, but at the end of the day, we are all on level ground. Nobody's more important around here. Nobody's more important than the people pressing buttons in the, in the production booth. Nobody's more important than the woman holding babies or the man investing in the lives of, of teenagers or the man that's standing down in fourth and fifth grade with kids like my son who's always doing the floss back and forth like this. No, nobody around here is more important than anybody. We're all on the same team. And at the end of the day, who's the king? Who's the leader? It's Jesus. That's who we want to get recognized. And what we're trying to do here as a church is we're trying to, to bring people face to face with the love of God, with their need for God, that Jesus has the ability to change their life. So what we're doing is anytime this platform is used in leadership, we're trying to set the stage and get out of the way. We're trying to set the stage so people can see it's all about Him. It's all about His glory. It's all about His kingdom. It's all about Him. And one day we're going we're gonna to be, those of us who are his followers, we're going to be in eternity with him and just declaring his praises and his glory. It's going to be amazing. Nobody's going to be jockeying for position at that point. It's all about him. I just love that image of Jesus getting the praise that he's due. And he's told us to pray that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. How's his kingdom come? It comes through suffering and difficulty and hardship and people who are willing to serve and bless others. Are you willing to give up today? You willing to give up that thing that you're holding on to? Maybe today the thing you're holding on to is the fact that you don't want to get baptized. Well, I got good news for you. God has made a way for you to get baptized today. In fact, in our back, we got some people with like these cool flashy things at all of our campuses. We have shorts and t-shirts and everything you could need. Um, so at, in just a moment, we're going to sing a song about less of us and more of him. And I want to encourage you, if that's you today, to take that step to go out to be baptized. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would come now and minister to you. Will you stand um, now? All of our campuses stand. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts today, to show us what it is that we're holding on to. I hope God's blessed you today. If he's blessed you, he's blessed you to make you a blessing to others. If you've received it so that you can give. Freely we've received, freely we give. Will you just invite the Holy Spirit? Will you bow your heads with me right now? Maybe this is the first moment in your life you've ever invited the Holy Spirit to come. Would you just say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Make space in our hearts right now to receive from you. Come. More of you, less of us. Just lay it down today. What is it that you're holding on to? Lay it down. Lay that relationship down. He's good. You can trust him. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your dreams. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in power. Come in mercy. Give us a vision. Right now, I just pray you give us a vision of our lives, of what we can become as men and women of God that that lay down our comfort for the sake of your kingdom. Do your work right now. Would you just invite him just to do his work in you, just making space today for him to minister. I encourage you now as we sing the words of these songs, this song to, to slip out. If you want to be baptized, don't delay obedience. Just slip out during this song to the back to take, that, take this step and let God minister to your heart today in a fresh way. Less of me and more of you, Jesus. That's our prayer today in your name.